Hi everyone, I'm Shafiq. I'm a research engineer at Khalifa University and today we're going to be talking about palette transfer in Python. Um, this presentation is uh, built in conjunction with an article that I recently released on Towards Data Science called Perils of Palette Transfer. So let's jump right in. Um, so what can what is the concept of a palette here? So uh, in, in, the, in the makeup industry that's like this box of colored powder that you can uh, a unique set of uh, with a unique set of colors that you can apply to like a face or something. Similarly, in uh, if you're an artist or if you're a painter, uh, then you would have a palette of colors, which is like a swatch, which then you uh, take and apply um, onto a canvas. Similarly, in the computing world, a palette is just basically a set of unique colors that represents an image or maybe a master palette that represents every single color um, in, um, in the entire library of colors, for example. Okay, so this is a, 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 an image palette uh, or a palette of an image reduced to its unique pixels, essentially. Uh, okay. So how do we represent color in uh, computers? Well, with colored screens and light, we always think of it as um, additive colors. So uh, meaning that it's built on the basic building blocks of three colors, which are uh, red, green, and blue. And the addition of which will create all possible colors uh, from black to white and everything in between. Um, and in computers, there are different ways of arranging uh, bits of RGB, and depending on what is called the color depth, you get a different number of bits for different colors. So, for example, in the 8-bit um, color scheme, you would have three red, three, uh, three greens, and two blues, um, totaling 256 colors. 2 to the power of 8 is 256. Um, in the 15 or 16-bit world, you might get a different arrangement and different number of uh, bits for different colors um, and the current standard that we use today uh, in basically every consumer product which has like a color screen uh, like your mobile phone or um, your desktop monitor depending on some dust, uh, desktop monitors uh, is something called 24 bit color where uh, there are three uh, uh, basically a byte or eight bits for red uh, eight bits for green and eight bits for blue um, because there are 24 bits, 2 to the power of 24 gives you a total of 16 million colors, uh, which is more than enough uh, for the human eye because um, it is said that the human eye can distinguish about 10 million different colors. Um, so 16 million is way beyond um, the, the, the limitations of the human eye. So this is more than enough uh, colors that you know, we need in a, in a standard environment. Um, so how does these uh, colors uh, change or be represented in different depths? Um, in in 3-bit RGB, uh, you know, you have this really blocky, really uh, simplified compression of an image, uh, but you can, you know, do some fancy tricks like uh, dithering to make it a bit more um, quote-unquote realistic. And with more uh, bits of color that we have inside what is called the master palette, um, you have much more detail, much more clarity, uh, a higher fidelity, essentially, in the information that is provided in the image. So at 24-bit, you, know, you, you essentially have um, true-to-life quality images. And you can think of the colors as being living in this three-dimensional cube of RGB. So in three bits, there are eight colors. Um, so each of the corners of these cube uh, of this RGB cube represents the possible colors, and you know the more bits you have, the the, the more granularity of the color that uh, you can potentially have inside um, this cube. And at 24-bit RGB, essentially, it's it's almost like a rainbow cube that is very very dense. Okay. So um, naturally, the extension of a, a, a single pixel is an image, right? So an image consists of a, a width and a height. So if we have uh, an n pixel wide and an n pixel high uh, image, uh, we naturally think of it as having three dimensions of color. So red, green, and blue for each of the bits. And therefore, it naturally lends itself into like this 3D matrix, right? So where we have a red component of the image, a green component, and a blue component, and they all combine to make uh, different colors in the foreground and in the background of the image. Um, to think of this as data, 
So you would have a matrix where uh, each pixel of the image uh, can be represented inside uh, some matrix. So here we have pixel one of the image uh, at index one, essentially. So the top left corner, for example, uh, the red uh, channel, the green channel and the blue channel. Uh, and then pixel two, red, green, blue channels, and so on until we have uh, pixel M by N, which is at uh, the bottom right corner, for example, um, uh, the red, green, and blue channels of that picture. So it really lends itself well into this uh, 2D matrix approach. So if we think of data as a tabular, uh, if you think of an image as a tabular data, um, you can think of it as being represented in this matrix um, uh, of N times N by three essentially. So um, if you want to think of it as being living in this cube, right? So it's living in this 3D space. So each point um, in your image lives in somewhere inside this uh, 3D cube. So for example, it might be like, you know, uh, some manifold uh, in this cube, not necessarily encompassing the whole cube. Uh, usually it doesn't for any photographic images. Noise usually is kind of spread out around the cube, but real images, they're always uh, kind of uh, tuned to some smaller manifold uh, rather than the entire cube. So if you want to think of this as like a, you know, like a data in an Excel sheet, so you have something like this pixel one up to pixel N and then the RGB component. And because we have eight bits for uh, each RGB component, then uh, we, we start it as a number between zero and 255. So eight bits, uh, uh, you know, it's 256. Uh, and because we have three colors, 200, uh, so we can represent them as uh, an unsigned integer uh, eight bits uh, with a value from zero to 255 very uh, very efficiently okay so let's begin coding and let's try and load up some images into python we're going to use colab numpy and the python imaging library uh, mainly the python imaging library works really easily with colab um, to view images and so on so that's where we're going to use that um, we're going to treat images as a vector of rgb pixels so uh, or rather a, a, a matrix uh, um, of m by uh, n m times n by three, uh, so each color is a feature and each pixel is a sample or a data point. And we're gonna because we're gonna find the palette where we're gonna apply a unique operation to the entire um, set of palettes, basically, rather than um, um, changing. Um, yeah, we're we're gonna. Uh, get a unique set of uh, colors rather than uh, keeping all the colors inside the image. Let's just jump into the Python notebook. So I'm going to import numpy as np. And then from the Python imaging library, I'm going to import image. That's all we need. So I'm going to say load image. I'm going to define a function called load image, where we're going to take a path to the image that we want to load. Uh, and first of all, uh, I will say um, image dot open path. So this will essentially take a, a, a string, which is the path to our file. We're going to open it as a Python imaging or a PIL image object. And I'm going to say this is our source image. And we're going to say, because Python imaging library works uh, well with NumPy, we can just convert uh, the Python image to uh, the, the PIL image into a NumPy matrix directly. So I can say np.array source image and I will get my, um, let me just make sure that I am not blocking any of the code. Apologies for that. Um, yes, so uh, I'm just going to have a vector x here which is going to be um, um, a matrix version of the source image that I loaded. So at this point, let's just return the source image and X. OK, so this just makes our workflow a bit easier. So I'm going to say load image. So I'm going to upload my image in the collab uh, environment. You can upload your images into here. So I'm going to load uh, the two images that I have. Uh, it's going to give you a warning that all these images are going to be thrown away later on, but that's fine. So I'm going to load Jerry's mountain landscape. Jerry Zhang, here we go. So uh, it will return me a, a 
Python image object and um, an array. So you can see that the array is some four dimensional. So it's because my image is a PNG, uh, but we can always convert this with, uh, with PIL uh, to make it RGB. So we only have to deal with uh, three, uh, three channels rather than um, including the fourth transparency channel, which we don't really need. So I'm just gonna say convert RGB. Okay, uh, let me load that again. Whoops. Uh, whoops, I put the convert in the wrong place. Here we go. All right, perfect. So now we can say source image is here, or uh, rather I should just say image. Uh, it's not necessarily the source image because we're gonna load uh, any image. So I'm just gonna generalize that. So my source image comma X is gonna be load image here. So with like I said, in the Colab Notebook environment, you can display uh, PIL images uh, very, very easily. So you just say display source image. And it will kind of show you what the image looks like. And then we can have a look at what the X um, uh, matrix looks like. So we look at the shape of X. So it's this 320 by 480 by 3. So 320 is the height of the image, 480 is the width, and 3 is the uh, RGB color channels, as we've mentioned before. So uh, we don't want it uh, like that. So we we want something. Uh, we we want to kind of string it out into this uh, matrix of pixels rather than uh, this three dimensional matrix of image. So we're going to turn it into a two D matrix uh, by simply just reshaping into minus one comma three. So this will kind of take the three hundred twenty by four eighty pixels and just pull it out into one long matrix. Uh, 2D matrix of 320 times 4, uh, 480 by 3. Um, and because we would want to be able to kind of use this palette to turn it back into um, the original image, it's probably important to keep the shape of the image. Um, so I'm going to say um, x dot shape, or uh, I'm probably going to move that up x dot shape is I'm going to say image shape or x shape or something. Um, so we're going to return that as well because this will be useful. Once we've turned it into uh, a 2D matrix, uh, we won't if we don't know the dimensions of the original image, it's kind of confusing to find out uh, by uh, you know going back into the code. So we're going to keep the shapes so that we can reshape later on. I'll show you why this is important. Um, at the same time, uh, we've mentioned that we want to make all the pixels unique, um, and this is a pretty simple operation. We just say x equals np.unique. On x, we apply it on axis equals to zero. Whoops. Axis equals to zero. Um, so that will apply the unique operation downwards on this 2D matrix. So it's going to say uh, pixel 1, uh, pixel 2, pixel 3, and it will see if that combination of pixels exists already uh, in, in the rest of the matrix and remove the, any duplicates, essentially. And we're, we're just left with unique pixels. Okay, so whoops. Uh, yep, that uh, I should load it first and then reshape it later. So I'm going to load the image, keep the shape, reshape it here, and then apply the unique operation. Um, cannot, uh, okay. Ah, sorry. I should apply np.unique outside and x.reshape in here. There we go. Uh, too many values to unpack. Yep, because there's three items now. X shape. Okay, perfect. So now the shape of X, uh, before it's this 320 by 480, but now because we've taken all the unique pixels, uh, we have 41,637 pixels. That's awesome. Um, those are the unique pixels in, uh, in the first image, in the source image, and we can similarly do the same for the target image. So I'm gonna say this is no longer a source image, whoops. Um, but rather we're gonna work on the target image. And we're gonna call the target image Y for simplicity. Um, and I'm just gonna load up a, the other image by Wolfgang. 
Oh, whoops. There we go. And display. Awesome. So our second image is this picture of a flower um, with a yellowish green background. And uh, if we look at Y's shape, so the number of unique pixels that Y has is 29,652. Awesome. So uh, from here, um, actually, you know what? It might be a good idea to keep both. Yeah. Um, because we need the unique pixels, but at the same time, I want also to get um, the actual um, image so that we can do transformations very, very quickly rather than having to reshape and all that. So I'm going to say, um, I'm going to have XU is going to be um, np.unique x and x is x.reshape. Right, so yes. So now we keep all the original pixels of x and we have the unique pixels of x. Um, together. So I'm going to say image x, x u, and x shape. So I'm just going to add x u here and y u here. So this will all be uh, apparent uh, later on. I messed something up. Uh, yes, because I did not rerun this function. Awesome. So now we have an x which has this shape. So the original 420, uh, sorry, 320 by 480. Uh, and we also have XU, which is just a unique set of pixels. Awesome. Okay, um, so from here, let's maybe carry on and uh, see where, where we go. All right, so um, we found out that the image has like say 30 or 40,000 colors. That's awesome, great. But what if we wanted only 16 or 32 or even eight colors inside you know, the entire image? So the, the image right now has 30,000 colors. What if we can reduce to the, you know, let's say eight, uh, eight colors that are maybe the most important. Um, but at the same time, what we want to do is we want to keep the original flavor, the, the, the textures, the, the, the structure of the image and everything, uh, and maybe just keep the overall, overall flavor of it. So the idea here is maybe if we can find a way to, to average similar pixels, right? So uh, the, the concept here is to find some form of differentiation between foreground and background or different, uh, different um, salient colors. So for example, if I look at this, um, uh, this, this color palette here, this, uh, sorry, this makeup palette, I can see like, okay, there's a set of oranges here uh, that I can maybe group as one single color. So I'll take the average of all the colors of these oranges and call them orange. And these reds look kind of similar. So I'm going to group all of the pixels of red around here and call them red. Uh, and similar for some purples and until I get eight colors, let's say. Um, it's not really trivial how we could do this because, uh, well, how, how do you choose which colors are similar and, uh, and all that. So perhaps we need some form of distance measurement, right? So um, in, in maybe RGB space, so in this uh, 3D cube that we mentioned. Um, so one way to do that to achieve this is by clustering. We group similar points together and we find clusters that are far apart, right? So red has to be far apart from, uh, far apart from blue, but the the group blue and red should contain pixels which are mostly blue and mostly red, right? So that's the idea here, so to do clustering. And one very common clustering uh, algorithm or method is something called k-means algorithm. So k-means algorithm works like this. We have a set of points. So let's think of this as our RGB colors in 3D space and RGB space. Um, we initialize a random point within this RGB space. So let's say we read randomly pick eight spots uh, within, uh, within the space. And then we measure distances from the center of that, um, uh, from that centroid that we've just uh, drew up, right? These eight centroids that we just drew up, we measure all the distances from, uh, from the centroid to all the points um, in the set. And if they are closer to point uh, to centroid one versus centroid two, let's say, then group them in centroid one. 
And if points are closer to centroid two than centroid one and three, for example, then group them in centroid two. So that's the idea. And once we have the measured distances, we have the group, we recalculate the centroids. So the centroids might appear so, uh, somewhere inside this 3D space. After finding the closest neighbors, it will kind of like move around. It will kind of shift to the average of the neighbors. So essentially we're iteratively averaging all these colors until we find um, some convergent uh, color. Okay, uh, and, and the, uh, the color analogy here is we find essentially the top K colors because there's a nice property of K means clustering is that finding or, or minimizing the variance of each cluster or minimizing the distance within the cluster is also maximizing the distances between clusters. And um, these K colors, these K clusters that we just, uh, we just found are actually, uh, you can think of it as the most important colors um, in the image. So let's have a vis visualization of how the K-means clustering look like. So here's uh, a video that I'm gonna play. So we have the centroids um, in the image here. It's marked as crosses. Uh, I don't think it's very visible. But these are the initial conditions. These are randomly just selected uh, out of nowhere. And we find which points inside the, uh, inside the, the color space. So this is a set of uh, unique pixels inside the image. Um, and um, we can see that this cluster is relatively small, but uh, you know, there's an X here and then there's a, uh, there's a centroid here, there's a centroid here. And these are the, the initial clustering. So as we go along, we can see the centroid move and these points being recolored as being closer to, you know, to this centroid versus this centroid. Here we go. Right, so we can see kind of like these points shifting around, but ultimately it converges at a point where all the clusters are far apart. And at the same time, all the, the variance of the cluster or the distance between all the points within the cluster is minimized, right? So let's say this is the set of colors that are green. This is a set of colors that are yellow. Of course, um, this is a PCA plot with, um, th these are not the real actual colors of the image, um, but this is the, con uh, the, the, the conceptualization in image of the k-means clustering algorithm. So once again, it can that we, we have a starting position and then we, we found the centers, we found the, the, the neighbors of the centroid, and then we average it. Okay, we average the points, we average, we average, we average all the way until we reach convergence. Oh, okay, something's wrong with the, uh, with the GIF. But essentially, yeah, until we reach convergence where the average doesn't change anymore. And uh, at that point, we have the set of eight colors which are uh, very, very important. Right. So how do we do palette transfer? So the idea of palette transfer is what if we had another image and we wanted to take another image's important color. Right. So let's say I have a picture of the mountain uh, as before, and I wanted to color this rose, uh, sorry, this, this flower with the color of the mountain. So essentially what I can do is I can just take these centroids, which are the most important colors of the other image and have it as my own color, right? So I would transform the image into you know, uh, just a unique uh, set of pixels, and I find the closest centroid to the pixel yi in the other image, right? And then I reshape it back to the original image. So in, in uh, you know, following from our clustering thing, so if I have a point here, which is a, a point in, my, uh, in the picture of the, um, or a pixel in the image of the flower, I just need to compare the distance between each centroid in the, uh, the k-means clustering of the uh, source image, and I can get, you know, I can get the pixel of that centroid and recolor the image um, uh, as I need. So, um, so here I'm measuring, okay, this one's quite far, this one's quite far, this one's quite far, okay, this one's close, this one seems to be the closest point to this pixel. So I'm gonna take this guy's color, essentially. Um, and you'll see some very interesting effects, but let's, let's try and do that. So what we're gonna use is scikit-learn. Um, it has a clustering algorithm, uh, the, uh, a k-means uh, variant uh, of, uh, of Lloyd's algorithm that we just explained, but uh, it's a better implementation uh, which considers bounds and, uh, and all this. 
So we have to be careful with the conversion because k-means clustering in scikit-learn uh, does clustering in float, uh, in, yeah, in 64-bit um, uh, float, but our images are only uh, uh, viewable in um, uh, unsigned integer eight. So we're gonna have to do some conversion and be careful with that. Uh, we're gonna visualize the palettes that uh, once we've reduced the, the image down to their uh, uh, to the to the k-means, we're gonna visualize the colors of the centroids. And as an exercise for you guys to try at home, maybe play around with different number of clusters. I'm just gonna do eight in the interest of time. And um, maybe here are some questions that you can ask yourself. What if we use unique pixels or not use unique pixels when we're clustering? And what if we have centroids that are equidistant? So if we had two centroids, let's say um, uh, I have a color that is blue, but is the same distance from green and red. So which, you know, which point do you pick? It's not obvious, but it might be uh, interesting to explore on your own. Okay, so here we go. Um, yes, so I'm going to import sklearn.cluster, uh, sorry, from sklearn.cluster, I'm going to import k-means, um, okay, and I'm just going to remove this guy, so I'm going to say this is my, so I'm going to initialize a k-means K means clustering algorithm. So I'm going to set the number of clusters. The number of clusters I'm going to say is eight. Um, and this is my KMN. So this is my K means object. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fit into the K means the set of unique pixels XU. Okay. So once we fit it, we can see the cluster centers. KMN dot cluster centers. Oops cluster underscore centers. Okay, so um, now it's running and it, it's found the, the set of uh, unique pixels and then it fitted on the unique pixels. It does all the, uh, the algorithm uh, as we've explained and then it found these centers. So there are eight uh, centers here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And these are the values of the centers of those images. So let's visualize them. So right now it's in float, so we're gonna have to round it up and turn it into a palette object here, which is just kmn.clustercenters, or I should just copy this guy. Um, and I'm gonna say dot round. So this will round it up to the nearest integer or round it down. Um, and I'm gonna say as type numpy.un8, okay? And then if we print out palette, I'm going to split this whoops, into, um, oops, I'm going to split this into a different place here. Okay, so yeah, essentially I've, I've just rounded these numbers in, uh, to their closest integer. And we can now visualize the palette. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna say image, this is the image, uh, PIL image object from array. And I'm gonna say palette. And I'm gonna say this is palette. Okay. Um, so we've just converted from the palette into a palette image. And I'm gonna display it. So I'm gonna display palette uh, image. Okay, so it's small. That's because uh, these these images are one pixels. Um, so I'm gonna say um, um, display image dot resize. We're gonna resize it up into uh, the size, the width. It's gonna be 32. The height is gonna be eight by 32. Whoops. Um, that is not why I expected because we just resized it using. Um, yeah, we just resized it using by cubic. I want um, image the nearest neighbor um, interpolation. Perfect. That is not the colors that I expected. Um, so let's see where we got uh, oh, where we went wrong here. Um, let me just say palette. That looks right to me. RGB. Ah. Yes, so actually, 
Um, one caveat, Python imaging library requires it to be three-dimensional for it to be um, a color image. So we're just going to have to fake that third dimension. So we're just going to reshape it as minus one, uh, one, and three. Yeah, so we don't need this convert RGB here. OK, there we go. So those are the, the most important colors from, um, from uh, the, the so you can see there's the blues, the, the uh, light blues, dark blues, oranges, browns, grays, which are typical of, uh, of, of the mountain image. So now we've the, we've have a, a reduced palette done by, uh, by clustering. We can do palette transfer. So what we can do is because we have this k-means object, we just need to fit it. We just need to do, f uh, sorry, not uh, fit, we want to predict. So we, we predict on y. So y is the set of uh, pixels, set of uh, all pixels in the image y. So what we can do is we can predict y. So now that gives you the, the cluster centroid IDs, right? So uh, it says this pixel in y belongs to centroid ID2, is closest to centroid ID2, centroid ID2, and 2, and 2, and so on. Um, so now we just have uh, a string of indexes. So what we can do is just say palette, from our palette object, we can just index. And then that will give us uh, uh, a 2D uh, representation again. And then we can reshape this into Y shape. And then we will get the original shape of the image, right? And then from here, I can just say PLT, uh, sorry. Um, uh, so I'll say this is my Y transform. And then I can say um, image from array y transform and there we go so now we've kind of converted the image of the flower from you know this uh this purple with green background into this um you know otherwise pre pretty interesting recoloring of uh, uh of, the, of the flower and of course you can uh, also do this uh, similarly for the mountain imagery you can kind of reduce uh, the original image down to uh, the eight most important colors by just applying it into x essentially so let's have a look at that there you go. So we, we've got now this cartoonish, blocky sort of uh, version, but we still keep like the structural and you know the 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 flavor of the image, the overall uh, idea of the image, right? So and from here now we have like a set of palette of colors that you can even use for like web design, for example, if you wanted a, a limited color palette. So there there are some interesting things that you can do from here. All right, perfect. So. Um, so the, the whole idea there is that what, what we did with the k-means clustering algorithm is we found the closest distance to the centroid of this reduced palette of an image, right? Um, but what if we, what if we, so uh, what we did was we just measured distances essentially to, to this centroid. But we could do that for the entire image, right? So what if we wanted to say measure the distance between every pixel in X to every pixel in Y, right? So because we're just measuring distances, we can find the closest pixel of every pixel uh, in, uh, in another image, right? To, to, to some other image. So uh, yeah, palette transfer here, we, re we reduce the palette and then we just measure the, the distance to the centroid. So what we need to do then is we just need to uh, uh, find the distance between this pixel to this pixel, this pixel to this pixel, all throughout all the 40,000 or so unique colors. Um, and we need to calculate the Euclidean distance essentially. So how expensive is that? Well, it's quadratic because if you have an image uh, with n unique pixels, and another image which has m unique pixels, then it's n by m, but at, uh, you know, at the worst case, it's n squared, essentially, um, which is quite expensive because you're looking at doing, you know, if the pixels uh, are in the order of 10,000, you're looking at doing millions to billions of calculations, right? So that's going to be quite expensive rather than when we were calculating distances to the cluster centroids, we only did a constant time, uh, or rather a linear time algorithm, because we only need to compare uh, n pixels to 
uh, to a constant set k, uh, let's say eight pixels uh, in the uh, in the reduced palette. So what can we do here? We can do a really slow for loop, which is just to check one by one, um, you know, in quadratic time. Um, or we can do it slightly faster using vectorization, but we risk our laptop RAM dying because in the process of vectorization, you're going to create this pairwise distance matrix, which is going to be really, really big. It's going to be in the order of 10 million variables or, you know, uh, 1 billion, uh, you know, pairwise comparisons. And your RAM is going to have to store something in the order of like tens of gigabytes. Um, so it's, it's probably going to kill your laptop or, or your computer. Um, perhaps we can find a middle ground, something that works, um, you know, not that slow but we can still kind of use the vectorization is when we introduce Dask. So Dask is this um, uh, distributed uh, computing library with uh, vectorization and NumPy. It's like an infill for NumPy um, if you want to do distributed computing. Uh, we can do something called chunk computation. So we kind of divide all these pairwise distance calculations into smaller bits of computation that is a bit more manageable uh, in memory. And you can think of it as having virtually infinite memory if you keep your chunk small enough. The trade-off here is that you still have to wait for the computation to run, uh, but not as long as a slow for loop that you know, do, uh, does the computation one by one by one. And because it's distributed, if you have like a cluster or something, you can kind of like um, you know, uh, defer these computations to different computers, collect them in, uh, uh, at the end once it's done. Okay. Um, there's a few optimizations that we're going to do when we're doing this pairwise comparison. Um, so we know that uh, we, we found, uh, we, we know that we don't have to measure every pixel in the image to every pixel because we just need to actually only compare unique pixels and maybe do a mapping, right? So if I have a set of pixels P in X and a set of Q, uh, pixels Q in Y, so I just need a mapping from the unique pixels of P into the unique pixels of Q. And then I can just, you know, uh, do, uh, do like a fast lookup um, and just look up those colors uh, at the very end. Uh, we're going to do calculations in sine 32 bit integer. So because the biggest, uh, when, when we're doing the Euclidean distance, we're going to have to square certain things. The biggest distance that we're going to have to square is 255, which is, um, you know, something like, um, 400, 500 something, uh, 500,000, is that right? 50,000 rather, which is, you know, which is doable within 32 bit integers. Uh, so we don't have to worry about um, um, uh, converting it to float or anything. So we can do all of this in, uh, in 32 bits. Um, uh, we don't need to do the square root. So in the Euclidean distance, this is the, uh, this is the distance measure that we essentially use. Um, so we do, we calculate the difference between the red values, difference between the green values, difference between the blue values. We square it, we add them up and then we do a square root. But really the square root doesn't matter because, um, the square root is a monotonically increasing function for positive values. So we can just throw it away. So to, to, uh, to kind of uh, tell you why that is. So if I have, um, a distance between point A and point B, which is one squared, point A and point C, which is two squared, point A and point D, which is uh, four squared. Um, if I take the square root of the distances, it's just one, two, and four. It's the same, it's, uh, the, the, the distances have not kind of changed uh, in the order that they are you know, uh, close to point A. So point A is still closest to point B rather than point C and point D when we remove the square root. So it's the same. Uh, one, uh, you know, uh, the, the distance one squared and one does not really uh, change that much from, you know, two squared and two, uh, or rather uh, it, it, the, the rank or of closeness does not change when we uh, remove the square root. So we can just throw that away to keep our uh, calculations very, very fast. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's do that. So there's going to be a lot of vectorization tricks here. I'm going to try and explain them to the best of my ability. Um, so don't be discouraged if, uh, you, you don't understand what's going on. Okay. So let's get programming. Um, okay. I have those guys. I'm going to import Dask. So actually from dask.array, I'm going to import something called DA. Um, and from dask dot, whoops, from dask 
dot diag uh, diagnostics. I'm going to import import progress bar. So progress bar just uh, because the computation takes a bit of time. I just want to see how um, how how far it's going. Um, okay, that's all we need. And then what we can do? Whoops. Uh, from uh, sorry, I want to import das array as da. Yeah, there we go. Uh, okay, so what we can do here is I'm going to do da, um, and we only need to consider unique pixels. So I'm going to say da dot um, from array, and we pass in uh, x u, which is the unique set of pixels in x. Okay, so now we have this uh, three by uh, forty one thousand, right? So the uh, basically the the set of unique pixels, and we're going to say I'm going to call that x u. Um, da, and I'm gonna do the same for y, right? So I'm gonna say y, y, and I'm gonna display x u da, and similarly I'm gonna display y u da. Okay, so I have my two Dask arrays. Um, these are like NumPy arrays, but um, they're they're not really they're kind of like lazily stored. So kind of like the computation plan is stored, but not the actual computation. So we don't do any computations when we um, when we do any Dask operations at the moment um, until we say compute. Okay, so um, what we're gonna do is we want to find all the mappings of so we, we, we want to transfer it into y. So y needs a mapping of y onto x, right? So a set of keys of y pixels and values of x pixels, right? Which are close to each other. So what we're going to do um, is find the... So first of all, we just need to find the pairwise distance between every pixel in, in, uh, in, uh, in the two, uh, uh, in the two uh, unique, uh, set of unique pixels. So I'm going to do yu, I'm going to reshape it, or rather yuda. I'm going to reshape it as um, minus 1, 1 by 3, right? So that will give me a 3D um, uh, matrix. But essentially, it's still the same information. I haven't changed anything. But this will allow me to do something like this. Attract yuda with xuda. I get this pairwise distance matrix, and the three there is uh, all the di uh, all the differences between the R, the G, the B. So basically, the delta Rs, the delta Gs, the delta Bs, right? So this is the delta R, delta G, delta B of pixel one against uh, pixel one in Y against pixel one in X, and we have you know all you know pixel one in uh, pixel one in X and pixel two in Y, pixel one in X and pixel three in Y, and so on until pixel M N in Y and pixel M N in X. So every possible every pairwise combination. Um, of course, we can't keep using U and eight. So I have to be careful here. So I'll have to convert um, yu and xu um, into np.long. So long is 64-bit int, but um, I'm just going to use it rather than 32-bit int. It, it really doesn't matter. But yeah. So yeah, we, we can use 32-bit uh, integers. But let's use 64 for the moment. Um, you know, in general, if you have larger distance calculations, this is the sort of memory that you're going to have to deal with. So this pairwise distance matrix essentially will occupy about 29 gigabytes of memory, as it says here, which is um, pretty, pretty ridiculous. So um, what we also want to do, uh, because the chunk, it's, it's taking the whole thing as uh, we want to actually be able to chunk this thing. So I'm going to say... Uh, we can say chunks equals, let's say, um, 4096, right? So this value, you, you can kind of tune it to uh, how much memory you have uh, at one point these chunks are. So uh, here, so we're, we're keeping at max like 400 megabytes per computation uh, in your memory, which is doable, right, in, uh, in, uh, in your laptop. 
Um, it's not going to blow anything up. But essentially, you're going to be storing this 29.63 gigabyte if we stop here. Right? If we did this computation and say compute, it's going to throw you a NumPy array that is 29 gigabytes and your computer is going to die. So bad idea. But all you need is not the pairwise distance, but which pixels are close. Right? So uh, essentially, uh, well, for once, we, we don't even need to leave it here. We have to sum up all the um, uh, delta R's, delta G's, delta B's. Uh, so we're going to do um, da.sum. And that will kind of, whoops, no, uh, we, we need to do it on axis uh, two. So basically the, uh, the RGB axis. So now we have this now pairwise matrix, uh, which is a lot smaller to store. Uh, we, have do, we have done the sum. Uh, actually, we need so square of the difference, and then we sum it together. And usually you would do a square root, but we don't, uh, we don't need to do a square root. Um, so this is basically our, and now, uh, and now, uh, all we need to do is just find the closest, uh, pixel ID, right? So we have, um, X, XU is a sorted list of pixels. So is YU is a sorted list of pixels. So what all we need to do is just find the index, uh, you know, uh, is it closer to pixel one or pixel two or pixel three, all right? So we just need a single integer value to represent, um, the output, right? So it's just a mapping of. 4,136, uh, 41, by one, which is, uh, the, and, and the one, uh, and the one dimension just says, which index, uh, should I look at in image X or XU rather, right? So this is going to, uh, I'm going to call it my mapping, uh, or rather my pairwise comparison, pairwise matrix is this. And then all I'm going to do is say uh, my mapping is going to be pairwise dot arg min. So arg min finds the, I, uh, the ID uh, or the index rather of the smallest. So pairwise dot arg min um, da uh, rather pair. I'll apply it over. Um, so let me see which axis over this axis uh, over this way. Okay, so uh, that will be axis one, axis equals one. Okay, and we can have a look at our mapping. Make sure it's twenty nine thousand six hundred fifty two by. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> don't need to do that. There we go. Yeah, twenty nine thousand six hundred fifty two, which is our yu mapped into every possible values of x. Okay, so um, once we're ready. What we can do is mapping.compute and it will do the computation for us. But because we want to visualize the progress, we can do with progress bar, pr progress bar, uh, and we can do mapping.compute. And we can return it as our mapping. Uh, right. And we run. So now it's basically doing all the pairwise comparison. So we just sit down, uh, relax, and have a cup of tea or something, wait until it's done. But usually it doesn't take more than a minute um, to, uh, to do this for small images of this size if you have pixels. Um, so naturally that would take a, a bit longer. But um, usually within, within a minute, uh, the, the worst I've seen is maybe five minutes for uh, a relatively big um, uh, image. Um, yeah, so once we have this mapping, like I said, which is just a, a vector of single values, we can now index u, right? So if we apply xu onto the mapping, we get all the pixels in xu that correspond to yu, right? So if we look at the shape of this, it's going to be the shape of yu, 29,652s, um, but it's now all the pixels of XU, right? So from here, what we can do is create a dictionary, right? So we can zip, um, uh, or rather um, create a, a mapping uh, dictionary, mapping uh, lookup table. I'm going to say dictionary, or rather we're going to use dictionary comprehension. Um, P four P comma Q in zip X 
uh, sorry, y underscore u, x underscore u mapping, all right? So this will give us now a dictionary mapping all the pixels in yu into all the unique pixels in yu, uh, in xu. Sorry. So once again, all the unique pixels in yu into all the unique pixels in xu. Okay, so if we print out our mapping lookup table, um, unhashable type, oh yeah. So um, NumPy arrays are not hashable, but we have a pretty easy way to do this. We just say tuple p um, and then dot to list. So we just make it a tuple, so it's hashable. Okay, so here is our tuples. Uh, or a mapping of our tuples uh, into arrays. And basically every pixel is now mapped onto uh, an array, um, uh, which is in, so all, all, the pack, uh, all the unique pixels in yu is now mapped to some unique pixel in xu, which is the minimum distance, right? So this is a, the closest pixels in xu that, uh, that it can find, okay? Um, all right, so now that we have this, what we can do is just, uh, apply this mapping lookup table from uh, on, on the pixels of yu, right? Because we are transferring from xu into yu. So I say yu, uh, so or rather y, and uh, or I can do mp dot. Actually, let's let's uh, make it make it easy on ourselves. So let's create a list of uh, pixels that we're gonna um, create. So uh, p and we're gonna do mapping lookup table of pixel p, right? For p in x, or rather y, right? So we're gonna look at, and we're gonna map that pixel into uh, the, uh, the, the corresponding xu pixel. And this is gonna be my y transform now. And just to make it an array, I'm gonna do uh, that array. So let's see. Uh, unhashable type, yep, we cannot hash. Um, and numpy array again, so we're going to say tuple p dot to list. There we go. Perfect. So now this image is now the image y, this this flower that we had, but with all the pixels coming from this image, right? So all the taken the colors of all the possible pixels in this image. Okay. So let's see what we get here. So I'm going to do um, yt dot reshape y shape y underscore shape and then I'm going to do image dot from array converting it back into um, um, converting it back into uh, a python image a python a pil image and then displaying there you go so now we've got this really high, uh, you know, high fidelity image rather than this blocky one, which I think has has some charm to it. But this com is composed of all the possible pixels in uh, in the mountains, uh, in, in the image of the mountain. So it's found that this orangey background is just to, um, you know, the, the maybe some uh, some uh, some of uh, the some of the greens in uh, in the in the flowers color and some of the blues here seem to have made it onto some of the petals and stuff. Right? That's awesome. So, um, but perhaps is that the best we could do? I mean, um, could we do better? I mean, there, there are some artifacts here, but um, actually we'll see an, inst uh, an instance where, you know, this, this actually falls a, a bit flat. So let's talk about color spaces. The, there's something weird about this RGB space that every color is kind of distributed evenly within this RGB cube, as we've said. So every color is equally spaced between 0 and 255. Um, and that's fine. That's a good, obvious implementation that is very trivial. But it's not a good visual one so um, or a perceptual one. And here's an example. So I've actually done this particular code. Uh, transferring all the colors from this flower onto this flower, right? So I'm thinking, okay, there are a couple of pinks here and a couple of reds and yellows here that might fill in onto this uh, petal very, very easily because of the distances and so on. So I was like, okay, clearly it's gonna pick out all these pinks, right? But when I ran the code, 
what we end up getting is this really drab brown which has come from this petal and I was thinking that's not right that doesn't seem true because these pinks are definitely much closer but in reality because colors are almost like equidistant from uh, from one another in RGB space it's not actually true in visual space in visual uh, in in uh, our eyes see colors differently like because we have a sharper green element for example you know we we are more biased towards seeing certain colors being similar so in fact if we wanted really it's something that looks like that rather than that so this is a different transferring that we did versus this really bright pink rather than this drab brown we really want to get like a reddish sort of thing that i said could come from here what happened here it's because of the rgb space so what we, what could we do what we could do is to transform the image right so there are other color spaces that these colors can live in so R rather than rgb maybe we can convert it into cmyk or cyan magenta yellow and key or hsl hue saturation and lightness another very common three-dimensional space that colors can live in um, so these are called linear colors and there are also non-linear color spaces so rgb is an example of linear where every point is kind of uh, like CAM, CIE, and UV, you have some non-linearity which allows for uh, a, a better color representation in terms of distances and so on. So it, um, you know, it's kind of it produces an image that is more true to life, that is more quote unquote correct, as you, um, as you hear in like you know Photoshop and um, um, all these uh, color uh, color editing software and so on. So we what we could do is we could convert all our images into this. Uh, non-RGB space or non-linear space, um, which is fine, which is a, a, a doable, uh, viable option. But perhaps we can work on a better distance calculation, keep our data in the same space that it's living in, RGB, but have a better distance calculation that allows for non-linearity. So I went scouring around the web and uh, I found this website which kind of details, um, uh, the author kind of details what, uh, you know, what his thoughts are on the different color spaces and he does some conversion into YUV and found that you know, there, there's a nice trade-off that we can do and he comes up with this equation for the better color distance that we can apply. So this might look scary at first but let's step, step through it. It's actually pretty obvious what he's doing here. So we have this like averaging of the red colors from uh, image one and image two. Uh, we'll call it R bar. And then there's like the, your typical delta R, delta G, delta B, which is what we do already, right? We uh, just find all the differences between R, G, and B. And then here is this big square root function with a bunch of um, numbers and stuff. Don't be scared. So all it's saying is if we blocked out this part, right? So if I had my pen here, so if we blocked out this part, blocked out this number four and blocked out this part essentially we get uh, the euclidean distance so what is this saying it's saying that rather than using the euclidean distance we use a weighted euclidean distance where the r values the g values and the b values are weighted differently in terms of their difference right so the the r uh, the um, r values are weighted with this coefficient 256 and then there's uh, four delta g which is pretty uh, easy to do and then there's this and another coefficient for delta b so it's kind of like a weighted um, euclidean distance that we can apply very very easily you know without much extra computation and it, you know, it will still do the job, right? Um, and that's great because we can, we can, uh, we can have a non-linear color field to transfer around without changing the color space that we're in, essentially. Okay. And that that's that's all it is um, saying here. So. Um, it's it's a, it's a pretty uh, it's a pretty smart thing to do, uh, essentially. So let's let's try and implement this color distance into our program and see what kind of uh, differences we may get in the output image, right? So I'm going to modify the Dask Euclidean distance. So the values get large. So I'm going to keep the long type to to handle some of the negatives, um, and we're going to do some bit operation tricks. And this is the code um, that he comes up with. So it, it, don't don't be too scared about all means. It's just a bitwise hack that you can do because um, these operations are done in integer space. 
uh, or yeah, in, uh, in, uh, in integer numbers. So we can do the shifting and multiplication and addition uh, without, you know, uh, w uh, while being true to here. Uh, and again, um, uh, like I said before, square roots are not important. We just want to find the closest distance so we can throw that away um, to simplify computation. Okay, so let's program that. I'm gonna keep referring to this because I keep forgetting. Um, but essentially, uh, we can go back up here and perhaps, you know what, I'm just gonna do it here just to make it easy on myself. So it says we have to, uh, I'm sorry if I'm blocking the code here. Um, so it says, uh, first we have to calculate the R bar, right? So uh, uh, let's calculate the R bar. The R bar, R bar actually just an average of the red channel, right? So if we have our Y uh, U D A, I'm gonna re. Uh, oh, it's already. Yeah, I'm gonna still reshape it. I'm gonna reshape it into minus one, minus one, and three. I'm just gonna keep that as Y U D A um, partially. Um, and then I'm gonna do Y U D A all the values in all the values and channel zero, which is the red channel, um, plus X U D A all values channel zero. So X U D A remember it's still a two D matrix. It's just Y U D A is a three D matrix because we want to do this vectorized uh, or broadcasted uh, subtraction. Um, or addition, sorry. Um, and we're gonna divide all that by two, and that is gonna be our R bar, right? So if we do this, guys, so our R bar is now this pairwise um, uh, distance, okay? Awesome. So then my delta R, delta G, delta B is gonna be pretty easy to do. So dr is just. Um, as we did before, uh, yuda minus xuda in channel zero. Whoops, we're just gonna do the same for d, uh, dg and db, uh, but changing these values to one and two. Whoops, one and two, um, and then that's it. Uh, well, not yet, <laughs> but that's it for the uh, delta R's, G's, and B's. And then we have that big square root term at the bottom, uh, which is just basically a summation. Um, how does it look like once again? So it says 512 plus R mean times R squared uh, shifted by eight. Okay, so let's do that. So um, 512 plus R bar or R mean in that sense. Uh, times del r squared. We can even do that if we want. Um, okay. And shifted by eight. That's basically the division by two hundred fifty-six that we saw in the origin uh, in the equation earlier. Plus four times uh, delta g. The easy one. And then the last one I can't remember is 767 minus R mean. So 767 minus R uh, bar uh, times uh, DB squared. So DG, don't forget DG squared um, times DB squared. And we're going to shift all of this by 8. Create a bracket around that, and then plus plus plus, um, and this is our distance matrix or our pairwise distance. Let's have a look and see. Make sure that that's correct. Uh, for array and int, okay. It seems like uh, it's converted to float for some reason. So make sure uh, to do integer division um, here. So uh, just double slashes is integer division in Python, and this should still work. Okay, and if we see our pairwise matrix, okay, it's the same as uh, it's the same shape as the one that we had before. Uh, we just keep this one commented. We can now do argmin and have our mapping matrix. 
Perfect. So now we've applied this uh, non-linear uh, Euclidean distance or weighted Euclidean distance, if you will, which should now produce a, a slightly different image uh, to the one that we've uh, had uh, here. So I'm just going to do progress uh, or compute um, the, the, the mapping. I use this um, uh, set of computations, you know, go for T, come back in uh, 30 seconds, and I'm going to create a second mapping lookup table just so I don't confuse with this one. So I'm going to call it mapping lookup table um, weighted Euclidean distance. Um, I should really call these things different names. You know what? Um, since we're following along, I'm, I'm just going to uh, ignore that. You can find all this code in a much cleaner layout in the article that I published on Towards Data Science. So don't worry about uh, you know, all the messiness here. It's just for you to kind of follow along. OK, uh, and my mapping lookup table. And finally, just to keep this image, I'm going to copy this down and just run it. Boom. So now we've, all, we've kind of like re removed that artifact at the top, but you can see some of the grays that appeared here are now gone. So we had a lot of grays, but now it's replaced by a much richer color and it's more vibrant, the color, rather than, you know, here it's kind of filled with like gray and drab and stuff. So here we get like this more vibrant, more true to life sort of, sort of realistic color, which is what we expect. And we can see that the equations have worked and it's really quite easy to implement all this in Dask. It's no different than doing it in NumPy, with the exception that you are now saving a lot of memory and you can kind of like distribute all this computation and handle really, really big matrices when we can't before. So that's the awesomeness of Dask. And at this point, we're pretty much done. Um, yeah, that's it. And so thank you very much. Um, I hope uh, you've kind of learned something from all of this. Uh, I, I think we, there's a, still a lot more to learn. There's a whole field of color theory that I kind of came across when I was reading this, which is very, very interesting to read into as well, understanding how colors work and all this. But essentially, you've kind of understood how to do clustering and k-means, how to apply it onto uh, an image sort of situation uh, on its pixels, how to transfer the pixels or the centroids of the clustering from one image to another image, and how to transfer all the pixels from one image to another image, and also to, um, to apply this uh, realistic uh, onto um, your distance measures. Um, you can find the original um, um, article on Towards Data Science. It's called The Perils of Palette Transfer. Um, there's probably going to be a link uh, to it somewhere as well, shafers.xyz. Um, you can follow me on uh, GitHub, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, I'm on uh, all those platforms, uh, and it's a common handler at Schaffer's. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed all of this. And uh, let, let, I hope you send me some really cool and interesting recoloring or uh, palette transfers of your images. And uh, I'd love to see uh, some really exciting ones. For me, when I came uh, to do um, this particular um, images, I wanted to find two sub images that had no colors that are common and kind of see how they transfer from one to another. So that that might be a thing that you might want to look into when you're doing this. All right. So take care. Have fun with palette transfers. And I hope to see what you guys create. Bye bye.